Welcome to the Fangoria panel. Let our guys sit down. I'm your moderator. My name is Josh Miller. Uh, if you live in LA, I do a horror screening series called Friday Night Frights all year round. Lots of different venues. Just follow us on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever to find out what we're showing next. But let's get on to these fine crews. We have many, many decades worth of Fango people here. Watch it. Let's maybe I'll introduce them in uh, chronological order. Over there, and some man is Mr. Tony Tim Hall. Yeah. He was the editor in chief of Fangoria from 1986 to 2009. Then this handsome guy, Chris Alexander, took over from 2000. Would you say nine or ten? Well, it would, yeah, let's say 2010. 2010 to 2015. Yeah. Uh, then things went a little dark. And now they're coming back, rising like the phoenix. They so went we have our new. Just interject. They went really dark, so we should. Anyways, that's yeah. the preamble for <laughs> our how lucky we are to be here. Editor in chief, Mr. Phil Nobile Jr. Josh, how are you? And then hey, here we have, kind of, technically she was director of marketing, but as she can talk about, she kind of was a jack of all trades, Jane of all trades, did everything. We have Dr. Rebecca McKendry. She genuinely is a doctor. She is. So that was not a joke. Actual doctor. Um, I mean, I assume if people showed up for a Fangoria panel, they know about Fangoria, but uh, I don't know, whichever one you would maybe want to take it, maybe just give us the kind of backstory on the magazine and how it started out, just some context. I think we all look to Tony on that. Okay. Uh, Fangoria was first launched in 1979 as a sister publication to Starlog. That was the leading science fiction magazine of the day. And Fangoria is, is supposed to be a repository of all the articles that couldn't fit in Starlog. You know, the Godzilla stuff, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Hammer Films. And um, with that first issue, there was sort of a hodgepodge of all this fantasy stuff, science fiction, and a little bit of horror. The, the fact that the magazine, you know, didn't really have uh, a direction at that point. But then the letters started coming in to uh, then editor Robert Martin that said, Give us more exploding heads from Dawn of the Dead. And Fangoria is, uh, it had a direction at that point on, and it became the, uh, you know, lead, leading a Bible of horror entertainment for, you know, now 40 years. Um, I, I came on board in 1985. I was a reader with the magazine in 1979. And, uh, yeah, it was the, the greatest moment of my life, uh, editing the magazine, being immersed in horror every day meeting all my horror heroes, and uh, it's been a great experience, and now it's great to see the magazine come back bigger, better, and bloodier than ever under the tutelage of Phil here. And um, yeah, that's, that's my story, that's what I'm saying. You went from a reader to the editor in seven years? Yeah, that's right. I, yeah, I, I was one of those kids who bought the first issue of the magazine, and I was freelancing for other science fiction and horror magazines at the time at, while I was still in college, but my big dream was always to uh, write for Fangoria, which I never thought would happen, because back then the magazine was uh, written by the two editors, uh, Dave Everett and Bob Martin, so there was really no room for freelancers, and then Bob quit the day I got hired to work at Starlog, and um, they needed someone at Fangoria, so I just fell into this uh, lucky position and realized my you know dream job you know right out of college. Nice. I did the same thing, but it took 35 years. <laughs> so, and now I feel kind of silly, honestly. <laughs> and maybe you guys could each kind of uh, I think Tony maybe you already kind of hit upon it. But can you guys talk a little bit about when you first discovered the magazine? And because one thing. I think that anyone I've ever met who worked for Fangoria has in common is that you always kind of wish We're all fans. I could write for Fangoria yeah, someday. Yeah, yeah my, I, I'll just jump in because I'm actually from Toronto, Canada, so I'm like the anomaly here. Uh, so literally, uh, the world of horror was another planet to me as a kid. I loved horror since I was born. I discovered Gene Simmons first, and he was my first vampire. I was like, holy shit. And then Frankenstein, and then Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the 78 remake. I saw that when I was like five. Donald Sutherland smashing his own head in. I'm like, but I remember uh, finding Fangoria on the newsstand, and I opened up. Do you remember? Are you all readers? Were readers? In the early days, uh, they used to have the screen grades where you'd open up the cover and it was a poster. Of course, nobody really took the poster out because you screw up the magazine. But I remember opening it up in the, on the newsstand and there was a picture from David Cronenberg's The Dead Zone. And it was Nicholas Campbell slicing his own suicide by scissors, cutting his lips. 
and I had never seen anything like that in my life. It was explicit gore, and it wasn't just a fleeting moment on screen, I was studying it. And I, I was not traumatized, obsessed, fixated. And I would keep going back to the newsstand and picking up Fangoria, and then seeing the, you know, the wizard behind the curtain, like how they did this stuff. And it started to become kind of like a tangible reality that maybe I wouldn't be just an observer in this world, that I might become a participant somehow. So, you know, it, was, it really was my Bible as a kid. That's, that's legitimate. It was an entry point. It was a gateway drug into a wider universe that through serendipity, I ended up as the editor, which is a huge freaking story how that happened, but it's just insane that it did. <laughs> Um, for me, I discovered Fangoria when I was probably in about fifth or sixth grade um, in Walden Books. And the rule in my house growing up was that as long as I had straight A's, my parents would never censor what I watched or what I read. And so I made sure that I always had straight A's so they'd never take my horror films away. Um, which meant that like, by the time I was 18 graduating, I had seen every horror film that they had at the local video store. And was then driving 30 minutes to join a different video store so that I could keep watching new horror films. And I ordered a ton out of the back of Fangoria. We used to have the classified Those section. So great. I did that all the time where you'd get these mimeograph sheets and I would send away for these videotapes that I had no idea what they are. They had international titles and then they'd send them back and I'd watch them. It didn't matter what it was as long as it was horror. Um, and so my parents, as long as I had straight A's, would get me the Fangoria at Walden Books every month. And eventually I got a subscription and I was probably in eighth grade when I got my first subscription and I'm still a subscriber. So yeah, it's been going on forever. Um, my story is similar to Chris's. I, I found it as a youngster, but so I was, I was one of seven children and my parents, God bless them, they did the best they could, but it was almost like a feral upbringing and whatever was playing at the drive-in is what you saw. So I saw The Exorcist when I was three and I saw um, American Werewolf in London on my 11th birthday and I cried and you know, horror movies scared the shit out of me. So when I discovered Fangoria, my older brother kind of hooked me up with my first copy and what that was was like, it cured me of being scared because suddenly I saw that it was craft. I saw that this is a, this is a makeup artist, this is a director, this is a screenwriter. And I, I discovered that world of filmmaking beyond even horror. Fangoria was a, a, a magazine that was talking to young people but not talking down to young people about yeah, filmmaking. Yeah, that's right. And that was significant. And it was the only one doing it. Yeah, because horror has always been kind of the ugly kid brother of serious cinema. But Fangoria legitimized it took it seriously. And like some of you younger, younger guys, when you watch a horror movie on Blu-ray or DVD, there's all those special features in the back. You take it for granted. You didn't have that when we were kids. Yeah. So Fangoria was that. And it was not accessible to everybody. So when you had it, you kept it, you know? It was like a hard-won victory to actually get one of those issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't at the store down the street. It was at the store two yeah, miles yeah, away. Yeah, everyone has yeah. a story where they had to go, go, had to go to get bicycle. It. And then there's a magazine rack, and there's Women's Day, and Good Housekeeping, and People. And up in the left corner was this bright primary color Fangoria. And I, I wasn't tall enough to reach it. And I'm still you know, not. But. In Canada, actually, it, uh, because we were very puritanical at that period, if you've ever, in, you know, Day of the Dead, Romero's Day of the Dead, or Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, when those were released in Canada, they were gore-free. Like, I'm talking Day of the Dead with no gore. And they weren't even, like, cuts. They were, like, someone went in there and just chopped it, so the music would jump. It was insane. So we went through a period that was really puritanical, and Fango was relegated to the porno shelves. And but when, you, when Tony brought out Gore Zone, I mean, forget it. We could never find Gorzon. Oh, yeah. We still had problems with that. There when was you no Linnea Quigley. Uh, yeah, with the, the Linnea yeah. Quigley with the chainsaw that got thrown off news. That, that was the the end of Gorzon in Canada. Was that, the, was that the end of Canada? That was my, yeah, yeah there, that makes sense. So it was really a hard one victory for me, especially. Well, and Tony, maybe tossing it back to you, building off this, because I had a similar experience with Chris when I first saw it. I think a lot of people did too, was it was kind of like zero to 60 in a second of the most fucked up thing you've seen uh, in a magazine when you first saw it, even like the covers. It wasn't no. like, oh, you know, it's Freddy, and then inside it's the gnarly stuff. Some of those Fango covers, like, I have a book you guys put out that's uh, all the covers ever. Right, and, and just right. flipping through it, even now, I'm like, man, I can't believe that was on the cover of a magazine <laughs> in the 80s. Can you talk a little bit about the philosophy, even, of how the covers looked, and just that you guys were always like, no, this is... You can keep pulling this off the shelf. We're gonna keep doing this. Yeah. Well, that was the best part of the job of uh, editing Fangoria was picking the photos. That you know, I picked every single photo that appeared in the magazine with special attention, always devoted to the cover. And we always try to find, you know, usually the slasher icons were the big sellers. Freddy Krueger 
it, um, you know, when we put him on the cover of the magazine, circulation always spiked. Jo uh, any of the Romero Dead movies, Friday the 13, Hellraiser, and you know, we always try to find a, a really gruesome image as well, but it had to be something that was tasteful and also looked re realistic. I think probably the grossest Fangoria cover was for Event Horizon, and it was this image of a guy with a, a spike coming through his mouth, uh, he speared on this giant spike, it was really gruesome. And I thought that would get us thrown off newsstands, but by that time, you know, the uh, newsstand, you know, the, the, you know, these uh, old biddies and these uh, PTA types were, you know, leaving us alone, and we were starting to get away with a lot more gruesome images on the cover. Same thing with Gorsum, we always try, I try to find the most, you know, group, for that magazine particularly, we wanted something gross. It didn't have to be from a popular film or franchise, as long as it was disgusting, that went on the cover, even if it was a direct-to-video thing or an Italian movie. Um, you know, we wanted something that would stand out like a stop sign on the newsstand. But that was always the most fun part of the job, picking out that cover photo. That was actually a good point. Is Gore, uh, Jim, does anyone remember Gore Zone? I brought it back for like five minutes a while ago. Yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. Issues of it. Yeah, like something like that. And the last one didn't actually make it to the yeah. finish line, sadly. But, but yeah, there was a Chaz Ballin who was, was my mentor as a writer. I mean, to, to me, he was like the Lester Bangs of horror. He had that column, A Peace of Mind, That's right, in Gore yeah. Zone, where he went, he took you by the hand and took you into this nightmare world of, of Italian and European and international splatter. But he wrote with such a rhythm, it was like jazz or something, you know? But the images in that, I had never seen those Italian movies, and, and so I remember like Roberto Lenzi's Make Them Die Slowly, and they're literally ripping the guy's intestines out. I, I was genuinely shocking and excited. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the, uh, good times. And, and Chaz invented all these great words too. We call them chunk blowers. Yeah, chunk blowers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, it had his own language. Spaghetti that, land chunk blowers yeah. for the Italian movies. And you read the web today, and every writer seems to be speaking Chazese. Yeah, Chaz, Chaz, Chaz definitely uh, left a mark. One of the things I love about the old covers is that in the days before the internet, they would just spoil the hell out of a movie, <laughs> and nobody cared. We're oh so spoiler God. phobic no, they now. It. People wanted that. And that's something that we're talking about with the new iteration of the magazine: is can we spoil a movie on the cover like they did in the old days, or will our readers turn on us? But you guys didn't really get a lot of uh, blowback about that back in the day. No, they didn't mm -hmm. uh, rake us over the coals for being, you know, spoilers on things like that. You know, we didn't, we tried not to spoil movies. Um, you know, Mike Gingle was, always, he was the managing editor at the time. He was always, he, he would always stop me if I picked a photo that gave away too much of an ending or whatever, you know. Um, but I, yeah, I always like putting the best pa possible pictures in my, even if they were a little bit of a spoiler. Yeah, but you know what, yeah. Tony? One thing you did have back then that we have now is if somebody was upset about something in the magazine, it took great effort for them to put pen to page, oh, God, write, yeah. mail it, lick the envelope, send it in there, it has to show up, and that's a lot of work. Now people just go, Blah, on the internet, Blah, so it's like a constant din yeah. of people angry about everything. But yeah. the, you never really had that. The importance of the cover still continued through um, to the end of our tenure there, because I know one of the best-selling issues in kind of the last couple of years that we were there was the Martyrs cover. And I don't think that there was a sudden giant boom in everybody loving French extreme horror. I think that it was the image that did it, um, of just the girl with no teeth on the cover. Yeah. I also love that oftentimes, um, and especially back in the old days, we would get the images for the cover months before the movie came out. Like oftentimes yeah. before the movie had even been finished in the post-production room. And so if you look at like the old Nightbreed cover, that monster that is on the cover did not even make it into yeah. the movie. Um, yeah, but it's on yeah. the cover yeah, of Fangoria. There's a, lot, there's a lot of examples yeah. about people seeing images in Fangoria that never made it into the movie. You Just, still hear about yeah. that. That's yeah. right, right. There was a scene from Hellraiser 2 that got caught with Pinhead dressed as a doctor. That right. even, not only it's did not it make it into the magazine, it was on the video box. And we yeah. got so many letters. Hey, what's this? What happened? What, what's the deal with this scene? I yeah, never it sure eventually it surfaced later, right? Yeah. 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 Bonus features. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as long as we're talking about the covers, uh, who here has seen the new issue of Hollywood, of Fangoria? Um, well, hopefully you guys, they're going to be, they got some issues over at their table after this, for those who haven't. Um, but Phil, can you talk a little bit about the decisions in what the new cover will look like? Because it's got the old logo again, got the film strip back again. Sure. Yeah, I think one of the early conversations we had was that we wanted it from across the room to look familiar, like to look like an old friend that you were recognizing from across the room. So we went full retro with the cover, with the little sash text and, uh, and the film strip, and 
uh, just really adhering to the, like a, sort of a 1983, 1984 period from the magazine. And then, so the philosophy is, is that as you, as you start to page through that magazine, it still feels kind of familiar at the front, but then as you delve in, it starts to evolve into something new. And uh, I think it's been pretty successful so far. People have been really taken with what we've done with it. The other thing that I said was that I wanted it, I wanted it to feel as special in my hands in 2018 as the 83 did when I was a kid. So the way we did that was that we just we kind of amped up the stock, we amped up the, uh, the contents. There, it's 116 pages and there's six ads in it. And Norm Jacobs, who founded Starlog, yelled at me about that in New York. That was fun. And uh, he's like, look, kid, it's free money. Stop screwing around. You, a studio said you'll check for $3,000. That's net, net. And I was like, yes, yes, sir. I'll do better next he time, sir. He was a blast in the office, he's I hilarious. gotta say. He yeah. was a trip. Um, but so, yeah, the I wanted the cover to feel like something familiar, but I, I wanted the magazine to feel like something new. So it's this weird balance. And that's, that's the philosophy for the whole magazine. It's like legacy and evolution. I want it to feel like Fango that you remember, or make you feel the way you did when you used to read Fango, but at the same time, I want to maybe try to tread new ground and find a new way to talk about these movies that we've been talking about for 40 years. And I think that we pull that off in the new issue. And to that end, uh, how early on did you decide that it was going to be volume two, issue one, rather than just issue one or uh, whatever the actual uh, chronological issue would have been? At, at the last possible minute. We argued for months because uh, there's some history to 344 is the last issue that went on newsstands. 345, they printed a test copy, but it was digital. 346 went to readers. 347 and 348 were created and never released. But those are magazines that were written by people and edited by people, and we didn't want to erase that, right? So if you look at that cover, and come by the booth and look at it, it does say Volume 2, Issue 1, but if you look at the film strip, in the little margin of the film strip, it says Fango 349, because we wanted to honor the people yeah, who did yeah. that stuff. I actually, you mentioned that one issue after the, my last issue, when I, it was the Elvira, mm -hmm. was the last distributed. The one after that was actually, and this is like, you know, touch upon it really quick, just so you know how lucky you are that Fango's back. When Beck and I were working side by side from 2010 to 2015, we were working with a publisher who was Kamikaze. I mean, I, I said it was like Brewster's Millions, where the guy had 30 million to get, and, and he had to spend it all to get 300, but he couldn't tell anybody, and everyone's like, what the fuck are you doing? But you, you appropriately said it was more like the producers. It was springtime for Hitler. We did not know what this guy was doing. He was trying to destroy this magazine we were trying to keep alive. And it was crazy. That's a whole conversation. Come by the booth, we'll talk. But that issue you're talking about was a great issue. And it's he, really good. He, he printed seven copies so he could send it to the Adverti some advertisers to collect the money that they owed to pretend the magazine existed so he could pay the printer to print it. So it was all this shell game that was going on. I really never thought I would see Fango rise like Lazarus again. I have again. one of the seven. Oh, you have one? I and, have one and of one the other seven. guy, Jason Benning, has one too, I think. Uh, so if you ever find one of those, it's like probably the rarest Fango. 345. Ever. Write it down. If you yeah. ever find Fango, Fango 345. 345 is the rarest That's Fango the one. ever. It's only seven. seven. Uh, and Tony, could you talk a little bit about kind of the real heyday when you guys started branching out beyond just being a magazine? <laughs> oh yeah, it's very exciting. We wanted to expand the brand into conventions, movies, videos, etc., uh, etc. Et and we were real trailblazers, especially on the convention circuit. Uh, Fangoria was the only one doing our conventions from like 1986 to, oh boy, to the early 2000s. 2014, we did our last one. Yeah, and uh, it was great times. Everybody who wanted to sell a horror film would come to our conventions and also wanted to be in the magazine. Uh, we, had, we created a, a video label, which became a DVD label. We had a video on demand channel. It's, the, the magazine kept expanding in different ways. We had trading cards, t-shirts, um, you name it. You know, we had all these different tie-ins. Uh, it was really fun, a really fun time to seeing the, how the brand you know, went from this little niche publication to last week being mentioned on the Goldbergs. How many saw that? The sitcom, the Goldbergs on ABC? Yeah. Fangori was on that last week. Or what about the week. Simpsons? I think With, that was uh, the Freddy Krueger. Yeah, we were on the Simpsons. Yeah. We were in movies like Gremlins and Friday the 13th, Part 3. Army so of it was, Darkness. Uh, yeah, very uh, gratifying uh, to be involved with that. 
But to me, the, 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 the most special thing about all of this is when a fan comes up to me and says, oh, I love your magazine, you're, you're, you're edited by Hari Heroes, and you see how Fangoria made a difference to people and inspired them to become filmmakers, like people like Eli Roth, James Gunn. You know, they say one of their prize greatest moments is when we put their movies on the cover and they have them hanging up in their office, uh, you know, so that's very gratifying to see that the magazine made a difference in, you know, in so many lives and in so many ways. It's when I came into the company in 2003, 2004, um, they were really trying to push us into other areas. We had um, a Sirius XM radio show hosted by Dee Snyder and Debbie Rashawn, and that was my first job at Fangoria's. I was an intern on the show. And then I went to research assistant, then I went to associate producer, then I went to assistant producer on it. Um, and that's really how I started to climb up the ladder. But we also had Fangoria Television was a thing. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. had a comic book line too, too um, where much, we did, yeah, we did five comics. We had the whole convention circuit. Um, but yeah, they were really pushing into every Actually, area. I forgot about that. That's how I became involved with Fangoria. I was writing for uh, Rue Morgue magazine, which was the Canadian uh, equivalent, sort of, uh, for many years. And uh, my, the way I ended up with, with you guys was um, there's a director named Uva Ball. Do you know him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I boxed him. Do you remember that stunt? Well, I got the need to wrap up sign. Oh. But, Phil, maybe talk a little bit about just the future of the magazine, what people can expect and what you hope for. Uh, well, we're going to put a pin in trading cards and conventions and, uh, you know, ice cream. And Don't even start on the ice cream line. Did Rebecca's you know I made, made her do ice cream, fango ice cream? Yeah, so that was um, the last year of the company of the, the uh, president that Chris was talking about decided he wanted to do a line of ice cream. Literally called me up on a Friday night and was like, Bex, by Monday I need four ice cream flavors. They gotta be Halloween and no one can ever have seen them before. And I spent my weekend coming up with ice cream flavors. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's, there's boxes of magazines on the dock of the printer that no one's picking no up. One's and it's only a $200 bill, but no one's paying it. But this dude wants freaking uh, ice cream. Ben and Jerry's. I mean, come on. <laughs> These people have scars. Um, so we're not doing that. But uh, call, so the, new, the new publisher of Fangoria is uh, actually a film producer by trade. He made Bone Tomahawk, he made Brawl in Cell Block 99, uh, and we're making movies. So our first one was called Puppet Master of the Littlest Reich, which... Uh, yeah, there it is, yeah! Wait do you see the next one. We're filming it right now, it's called Satanic Panic. Directed and by a wonderful friend of mine, I can't wait to see it. Directed by Chelsea Stardust, written by Grady Hendrix, who wrote Paperbacks from Hell, you guys might know him. Uh, and we've got a couple movies coming after that. We're, we're remaking Castle Freak. We've got a female Frankenstein thing called Afterbirth coming, which is pretty cool. Um, that's part of the same company. It's a small company, but uh, my, my primary role is getting the next issue of the magazine out. So we're quarterly now, so the next one will be January, then April, and then July. If anybody hasn't gotten the first issue yet, I want to tell you that we are very low on copies, because uh, we're kind of new at this. Um, but if you subscribe by November 9th, you'll get issue one. So do that. Subscribe. It's cheaper than buying it from the comic shop. Uh, that's yeah, but, but, but at the table, there are t uh, a small quantity. Yeah, right? we love it when a lot of Yeah, there's, we have 19 copies at the table. Yeah, right, right after this, uh, <laughs> their booth is all the way in the corner. They'll be there signing stuff. You can ask them more uh, detailed questions if you, you can have. subscribe. There, there are 19 copies left of that issue at that table to be signed by this man over here. So you will need to fist so fight gotta, each you other for them, is what you're trying to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another little bit of business, uh, Frango's presence here is sponsored by a cool new thing called Scener, um, which is a Chrome extension plugin, whatever you call it. It's a cool idea that basically if you're watching um, Netflix or Hulu or a movie on YouTube, you can listen to commentaries oh. along with it, just like you want on a DVD or Blu-ray. And the extra cool thing about it, like filmmakers will be doing it, maybe just famous people who are fans of movies, and you can do one. You can just record your own, and somebody can listen to you talk about your favorite movie. And tonight, right, you guys are going to be recording one for Cronenberg's The Fly. The Fly, right. yeah. Wow. yeah. yeah. Uh, so check that out. It is called Scener, as in I've seen it. Uh, but why don't we give a big round of applause for our guests, you guys. Come on all over. I'm applauding to the fans, actually. You know? Thanks for listening, guys.